Okay, Mr. Craig Newbauer. Craigie Bear. Our boy Craig. Craigie Bear. He had a number of questions for us, and uh, he's his first one was turning around the GLR faster. And for those who don't know, a GLR is a general loss report, which is kind of like a overall report of what happened in the claim and what we're doing about it. Um, how thorough or how brief is Matt? I work dailies, and you see stuff. You, and you see stuff that needs some explaining. Sometimes you have almost have to sell it a little bit, which you know we talk about a lot on here. Um, so how does Matt write his narrative effectively? And his next question is: Is setting reserves? Um, his estimate came out to eighty-six thousand dollars, but there was a PA on it. His estimate blew mine out of the water. Thing is, they're going to come to an agreement somewhere. Where do I begin to figure out what is an appropriate and or accurate reserve recommendation early in the process? And do I actually say, uh, and do I actually say something like, in light of the policyholder securing representation? Right, that's, that's part of the question. Um, is there a formula for reserves? Does it differ? Does it differ with different types of losses? What about PA involvement? Uh, on reserves again. Um, so what does an experienced adjuster take into account, especially when the adjustment is more complicated? Let's start with reserves. Um, typically, most managers have a uh, draft authority that's less than $86,000. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of them be, will be less than $100,000. Uh, depending on the manager, uh, I would say you set your reserves where you think it's going to be, right? I mean, you can give a, a kind of a – it basically, if you encounter a loss that looks like it's going to be really, really big, like more than, say, $35,000, we'll say, then I'm going to – your manager needs to know about it for a large loss the large loss reserve and you may have to get approval on that right um some companies especially doing hail and cat stuff um may not make you do reserves and things less than 25 grand because they're like well we're just going to set reserves for everybody for twenty five thousand dollars or for whatever it is and then if it's going to be more up to that or more then we'll you know we'll uh deal with it then but usually a manager's got to get involved for anything that's over like 25 or 35 thousand dollars generally speaking right right um, <clears throat> um i would say if you have a pa involved i mean it's really hard to know exactly what to set your reserves at until you've actually written your estimate um when i was a staff adjuster i would set a ballpark of what i thought it might be and then when i wrote my estimate then I changed the reserve to exactly what the, what the, my estimate was. Right. And if it changes later, then you just change it again, right? So, you know, kind of long story short on this one, for reserves, they can change the reserves if they need to. They can make them lower or higher or whatever. And it's just really them being able to tell their, their bank what they need to, like, set aside out of the loss reserve for this particular claim. So I wouldn't get too – I wouldn't spend a whole, a whole lot of time trying worrying about it or think, you know – thinking about it or whatever, just if you think it's going to be a $25,000 claim, then set your reserves for $25,000. If it's going to be more than that, set it for more than that and maybe let your manager know. If, you've get, if you're coming out to $86,000, then obviously I'm going to set my reserve to $86,000 for what it is because it may not change, right? Right. The, the insured may fire the PA and some contractor comes in and does it for that or less or who knows, right? So you set it for what it is at the time um, and then later they can change it. Pretty straightforward. Good question, though, Craig. Here you go, Craigie Bear. Got anything you want to add to that? No. I mean, again, no, my... No, but yes. Well, you know, my... my. I haven't had to worry about that. It's not that so, common on... Yeah. On uh, CAT. For, depending on who you work for. Some some companies make you set reserves at, like, dollar one. Other ones are like, we don't... There's no way to do it in our right. system for you as the IA unless it's more than whatever, and then you have to reach out to a manager, fill yep. out a form. So um, I think State Farm and Allstate make you set reserves on everything, but like American Family, at least they didn't used to do it anyway. I mean, you, I, wasn't, I had, didn't set reserves for years on all the claims I did for those guys. Uh, and I didn't have to set reserves. 
I mean, for I, who? Uh, State Farm. Oh yeah, so that, I didn't yeah. have to set anything. I mean, it either came with a dollar amount already plugged in. Yeah. Uh, that the um, manager had already plugged into it, or it had nothing. Right. So. And I so, really had to worry about if my my authority if, if it exceeded my authority, and I think I had like forty thousand authority, so that was good. Yeah, and field adjusters aren't going to have very high authority, um, you know. So all right, so then your earlier part of your questions, Craig, turning around the GLR faster, how thorough or how brief is that? So for the the general loss report, for narratives, for activity diaries, for settlement notes, whatever it is that you you know, GLR is basically the the thing that you write that says what the coverage you know what the what the loss was the data loss it kind of recaps the, the the facts of the loss and then it tells what exposures there were on the pol from the policy you know so if it's dwelling um if it's contents if it's it's loss of use it tells how the the peril is affects those so you do a coverage analysis right so you, you would say um, water damage, you know, damage to dwelling, which is the coverage yeah. caused by water uh, from this particular source is covered or not covered, right? And so that's a coverage analysis. And then you tell what you're going to do or what was damaged. Kitchen was damaged. This was damaged. That was damaged. And then what you're going to do about it. Do repairs here, replace this, replace that, repair that. And then from there, then it's ticking off basically check boxes, you know, was there sub, sub row or salvage? Was there were there any relevant prior losses? You know, what did you say to the insured? Was there were there any third parties involved? Like any restoration contractors? Any, you know, asbestos remediation or testing or any of this or that? Or was I tell you so all that kind of stuff? And those are basically checkbox kind of things. I've got a template for that somewhere. There's templates. So generally speaking a company that makes you do a glr is probably going to have a template for you mm -hmm. um and then you you know a lot of those things you're not going to be like having to address all the time like subro and salvage it's not that typical on cat losses to do subro and, and so really almost never subro and it really depends on the site management for salvage right and generally speaking they're not going to be out collecting gas grills and steel gutters and all that kind of stuff to, to sell off as salvage they are garage doors they might but probably i mean most most of the times when i've done it as doing cat we didn't nobody was collecting salvage so it's like you just say no there right so in a lot of those things you can say no or yes or not relevant or na right um so really the, the thing is usually mostly written if you're spending a lot of time uh you, you want to write the parts that you do have to like spend some time writing. Like for example, uh, what was damaged specifically and what you're doing about it. Just tell the story because, and, and tell it, I would say in broad terms, because whoever's reading the GLR can also refer to the estimate and they can also refer to the photos. So you don't have to, go into excruciating detail exactly what you're putting into you know how many square inches of this and linear feet of that that you're using and you know how many gallons of paint and all that kind of stuff i've seen some glrs where people like they just go overboard explaining exactly what they're doing and you don't have to do that you just have to make it the people that are reviewing the files they just want to see that the facts the, the facts are in there there's water damage to the kitchen and in the kitchen we had damage to the drywall and the ceiling uh two of the walls you know, upper and lower cabinets, and you know the the countertops are this, and just kind of recap everything in, in basic terms. Um, replacing all the cabinets in the kitchen, replacing the floor and in this area to this to this other area, to this nearest natural break or whatever it is, um, and then the file reviewer or the desk adjuster or the file examiner can go dig into the estimate for more details on that stuff. But uh, I would just say. You, this is a, it's a good place to, if you're going to deviate from the estimating guidelines a little bit, or if you're going to try to do something a little bit out of the ordinary, this is where you're going to want to explain it, right? And then also have photos that back that up, um, for sure. So, and if if you're working for a company that, that doesn't make you do a GLR, or doesn't require you to do it to do a GLR, and they just want you to recap the claim in your activity diary, 
then it's basically you're hitting all the same things as you mostly as you would in the GLR and it's it's the same deal. So if you're gonna have to to add if, if you're putting some labor hours in there where normally you wouldn't for something as long as you get in there and explain it and sh and explain why it's needed in order for the work to be done, then that's the place to do it. And that's, you know, that's where you sell things. Right. Um, so that's, like I said, not everybody does a GLR or has a narrative report, uh, but a lot of companies do. Um, but you still have to, no matter whatever you want to call it, you still have to explain the coverage, you know, you do your coverage analysis explain what was damaged and what you're doing about it and you know where the, the claim is now that just left your hands what needs to be done on it if anything if it just needs to be you know paid then that's probably you would say the next steps are let's pay this claim and, and right. move on down the road are you an insurance adjuster then you need insurance adjuster if you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. I really think you should get both of them. It doesn't matter if you're a W-2 or 1099 or work carrier direct. Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the Insurance for Adjusters free guide, go to cplic.net slash adjustertv. So Marion Willis says, best of luck with the podcast. I will be tuned in. Here are my topics uh, slash questions. Transitioning from a staff adjuster to IA. And under that, we have a couple of bullet points of transferring licenses and where to start in the process. Uh, she wants to know about CE and additional training. What are the best websites to complete CE credits? Which CE credits are the most applicable, applicable to the job? And claims careers, how would an IA branch out into other losses other than CAT? Is there a need, for, and finally, is there a need for IAs in the SIU, casualty, or commercial fields? And those are, those are actually quite a few topics there, I think. Um, so transferring from a staff adjuster to IA is as simple, to, as, simple as um, quitting your job. <laughs> it really is that simple. I mean, just say hasta la vista to your boss and scoot out and put up your shingle and beg, I would, yeah, beg for I would work. say save some just, money. Yeah. I mean, so your licenses, as a staff adjuster, um, they're going to hook you up with your licenses, right? So you, you probably will only have to fill out a little few pieces of paperwork here and there, and they'll take care of the rest. And next thing you know, you've got like 24 licenses. Um, some, most licenses are your licenses. Some licenses need to be transferred. New Mexico is one of them. Uh, Florida, you have to re be reappointed or right. do it. Self-appoint. Yeah, self-appoint. Um, and there California. may be some other ones that do something different. Um, so that's, it's pretty much as simple as that. And as far as like, you know, if, if you were a staff adjuster, if you were doing property claims, uh, then you probably received some pretty robust on the job training or training and then on the job training. When I was, I was a staff adjuster, even though I had been an adjuster for 17 years, they still made me go through their whole training program for noobs. And it was four months of training. I didn't touch a, a real claim for four months after I like officially started. And it was the same deal. It was, you know, they had a, uh, a couple of mock-up houses inside of a warehouse and you went sat through a bunch of classes and we traveled all over the country went to dallas a bunch um did policy training did uh all that property training it taught you exactmate and everything and then you did ojt on the job training and where you shadow a guy for two or three weeks another adjuster and you write you they put you up in a hotel like that was in in uh where was i new hampshire New Hampshire. Three, New Hampshire for three weeks. And uh, right before Christmas, or yeah, it was right after Christmas. <clears throat> anyway, um, so you should have training already, depending on the company that you're currently working for. Um, for, you know, for CE credits, I mean, that's just a matter of just fill, fulfilling. You got to do it every year. So, you know, there's only so many yep. different ethics courses you can take every year. Um, if you get on adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro, 
there's a section on there that's, that has links out to CE uh, packages. So if you, if you, if you're, and you get, you get the CE credits for your home state license, right? And then right. They, they're applicable to the, the reciprocal licenses. Right. If you have another license like New York that's not reciprocal, then you'd have to take CE for New York too. But if you've got Texas and you get your Texas CE and it counts for your Arkansas and your Oklahoma, right? right whatever. So and your Florida. Yeah, and, and Florida and, and all those other yeah. states. So it's 99 bucks for a package of CE courses that will f- fulfill whatever your state's you know, like yep. if, you, if you've got it. Which reminds me, yep. I need two more hours. I have to have done in a month. By Please when? Say, end of January. Well, we should be able to get those at NACA. Yeah. If you sit through a class. Or I or can could just, I mean, two just hours. Go, yeah. That's I easy. think I'd just rather Probably safer through. to do it because who knows how. And they have to be, they have to be, it's the uh, classroom equivalent. Right. You got to have those. So. Yeah. I really do it sitting in my pajamas. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you're going to be helping me yeah. shoot video of anybody who wants to come see us at NACA, even though this will already be after. Never mind. Hey, if you saw us at NACA, like and share this video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how would an IA branch out into other losses other than CAT? How do you branch out to other. Losses. So how how are you able to handle other losses as a claims professional besides cat? Well, I mean, so here's the difficult part for me on that is that, so you don't have to decide if you're going to do cat or just dailies, but I will tell you that if you're wanting to do dailies, don't expect a lot of work if you're doing cat because a cat's going to come along. You're going to want to go make that big dollars. And you're going to run off and do that. And you're going to have to tell your daily firms, hey, I want to be gone for a while after they've been depending on you. Yeah. It could create a problem. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah. if you want to do, there's a lot of things. It's the Insurance is a broad industry. There's a yep. lot of stuff that you can do. I mean, there's there's auto, there's liability. There's, like you said, there's casualty, commercial, healthcare industry stuff. Um, there are independent adjusters handle all different kinds of claims. There's Marine, there's inland Marine. There's, I mean, there's all different kinds of claims. The, I would say that, that a, a progression for an independent adjuster, uh, you know, you can do cat for a few years and really get your claims chops down. But I would say, you know, you, you probably want to try to always be moving up a little bit. Um, if you're doing cat residential property, <coughs> then the next logical step from there is going to be commercial, yep. right? Commercial claims. So where I was going a second ago was if you're doing cat and you're trying to get into other stuff and you're trying to juggle more than cat, just remember, whenever you get a, you know, called to do a cat, you've got to up and leave. Okay, so whatever other pursuits you are doing have now been put on hold, and right. those companies that you were doing that type of work with, they've now been put on hold. And so, if you don't have a solid relationship with those companies prior to jumping out and leaving them, um, chances of getting work on the way when you come back is more difficult. It's like starting all over again. And I know this because, as I mentioned before. I went on seven different assignments this year out of town. Every time I came back in town, I got work, but I wasn't getting the volume of work that I was getting prior to the first time I left this year. Okay. And, and it's still not back there. And as a matter of fact, because I left seven times this year, um, one of the companies said, Hey, look, man, we just can't have you coming and going like this because right. we, we like using you and we get to the point where we depend on you and then you up and go again. And that just creates too much of a problem. So I've lost a source there. And and it's not, you know, and again, I do several different types of claims. I do property. I do auto. I do heavy equipment. I do RVs. You know, um, I'm doing all kinds of things like that. And this was a company that I did a lot of heavy equipment claims for. 
you know, and they're just, they pulled the plug on me Yeah. because of, I wanted to be a cat adjuster and I wanted to go out and, and, and work that this year. And so you have to, you, you don't have to be one dimensional. Okay. But you just have to realize that if you're going to do cat, whatever, and I did cat on both property and, and auto and equipment, but you just have to realize, are you going to do cat? Or are you going to pursue something else? Cause cat is really going to, you really make great money in it. And I had a great year. Yeah. Um, it's going to hurt you, you know, when you're trying to do other things other than cat. Yep. Yep. That's it's, it's almost one or the other, um, unless you develop really good relationships with yeah. a handful of companies that can feed you stuff over the winter when there's not really any cat, right. but it's still, and that's where that, you know, photo and scope stuff and the virtual assist stuff can kind of come into play because yep. you can turn that on and off on your app Correct. phone. And that's still, I mean, in, in a, a lot of cases, the money can be, you know, almost competitive with, with what you might make it. And as I've a done well with photo and scope. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I do a few, you know, a week and yeah. it's helping, you know, feed my herd of dogs. <laughs> right. So. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. This is Adjuster TV. I mean, it is what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. I don't know if I've seen that people complain about it that much these days. Cause I mean, it's two years ago. It was like you, you say virtual assist or photo and scope on social media. And you would just, I mean, Get your blasted. computer would turn on fire, catch yeah. on fire. They're um, still out there. Yeah. They're still out there. I think they've just kind of given up complaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is like, it's, it's in the salad days, you know, as a, as a cat adjuster, cat property adjuster in 2005 mm -hmm. or 2001, you know, you're getting 65 or 70% of the fee bill. The fee bills are high and you're, you know, you're just, you're able to run and gun and just like, you, you can crush it pretty easily these days with the computers and everything. Everybody's competing with their apps and their technology and their insure tech stuff. And it's still all up in the air, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty on our end, like, well, what's it gonna look like when it all, when the dust settles? Mm -hmm. And who knows? I mean, it's, it's I, I, I think that the, the carriers, they still compete on customer service and they're gonna, you know, if they try to make things convenient for, for some people. Um, it's inconvenient for others. It's inconvenient for others, so it's, they, it's is who knows what'll what'll happen but that's why i say you know if, if if you have a progression in your career if you get out of like the little claims the hail claim the you know, residential hail claims which is you know it's kind of the bread and butter of a cat adjuster but at the same time it's kind of small time compared to being a commercial cat adjuster or like a commercial daily adjuster or a general adjuster or a large loss adjuster somebody who specializes a mm -hmm. little bit condo right you know, nobody likes doing condo claims because they're so complicated or they get, they're just, there's too many moving parts in a condo. I don't like doing them, but I could, you can definitely see where if somebody said, you know what? I know nobody likes to do condo claims. So I'm going to be the condo guy. I'm going to be the, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one that the go-to person that's, you know, can knows everything that there is to know about condos and I knock it out of the park. So if there's condo claim and condo claims can pay really, really well, they're like commercial claims. They can be right. huge. So even on the cat side with hail or whatever, they can be gigantic. Um, so if you specialize and you, and you, you build a level of expertise, that's, that's, that can't be replicated by an app. I mean, then, you, then you've, 
you move your career forward in a way that kind of insulates you from this all this technology right. changing stuff, right? And back to the um, virtual assist, it, it works well. I mean, it. There's some frustrating things about it. You know, we've we've been talking about one that I've been dealing with now for a couple of weeks. But uh, you know. I've done well with it. I mean, I, I mean, prior to, I mean, that's what I was doing whenever I had my accident, you know, and, and, uh, came sliding off a roof, Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what I was doing. And, um, and I was making, you know, I was making several thousand dollars a week doing it, you know, and, you know, you can knock out five a day easy, you know, sometimes six a day if there was the, if there was enough volume there to do it. And the, the great part about it is, hey, you're just showing up, taking pictures, you know, documenting stuff. Yeah. And then you're done. You're done. And you're only, I mean, and depending on what you did and equipment used and how much you did on that particular deal, you could make 250, 300 bucks a pop on them. And you're not having to deal with anything. And once you walk away from it, you're done. So I don't see what the big, you know, complaint is about this. But, uh, Complainers are going to complain. Haters are going to hate. You know. <laughs> well, and that's honestly that's the easiest and the funnest part of the the whole process. Yeah. Scoping. Yeah. The loss. Right. Yeah. Writing the claim sucks. Yeah. All the rest of that stuff, making phone calls. Yeah. Doing reports and GLRs and no, just I can just go out and just scope losses and then just get paid through an app on my phone. You know, and and uh, I'm going to do, I'm gonna do and, it. I mean, and I work with a couple of different companies doing that and then I enjoy it. And there's some perks, there's some hidden perks to, to doing that. And, and, um, you get into doing it and you'll find it and you'll, you'll find it. It's not so bad after all. So hope we answered your question, young lady. Mr. Binks, uh, commented, I believe on YouTube. Will this be Jar Jar? Uh, yes, okay. this is Jar Jar. Okay. Mr. J. J. Binks uh, wanted to know the best way to get my foot in the door with adjusting. I'm currently licensed as an independent adjuster, but would becoming a staff adjuster help get my foot in the door? Love the content. Good question. Um, I think that this this I see this a lot and I see this a lot as from people who say, you know what you need to do is you need to go become a staff adjuster for a year. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm never going to tell people to go do that for there are a number of reasons. One of those reasons is that if carriers see my content on YouTube and that I'm telling people to go, go get hired at their company for a year and then quit just right. so they can get training and pay training. Right. I don't know what would, if anything would happen, but it, I don't think that's, that's not a good look. Right. I don't, I think it's counter I think it's counter productive because Carrier, the carrier path is not an invalid path. It's a, it's a good way to go, especially if you get started early, right? If, if you're just graduated from college or high school even, or you're in your like mid-20s. You don't have the resources to sustain yourself while you're trying to get a business off the ground. I, would t I, I know people on the carrier side who got started when they were 22, 24, 26, who are getting ready to retire in their mid-50s. Yep very 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 well off and then with a pension after that right and all they did was was just show up you know do the co corporate thing and now they're getting ready to retire and you know something i preached to one of my one of the young men that i helped raise that uh you know hey jump in now right out of college you know a few years from now you look at your 401k oh my gosh yeah, you know, Match, the matching on that. Oh yeah, I mean, it, IA versus staff adjuster. Are they asking should I become a staff adjuster first and then flow into IA? Or yeah. Are they saying one versus the other? That's what they're. That's that's the gist of that question. Is should should they become a staff adjuster first um, because they want to be an IA? Would it be no, better to do I, that? I, I, you know, you want to become an IA, become an IA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, don't become IA light. You know, just go for it. 
figured out what you want to do, put yourself in that position that you can do it. You know, it's, we've all said, Hey, if you're just going to quit your job and become an IA, it's probably not the smartest thing in the world to do. No. You know, I mean, I can tell you that if I had to do it all over again, you know, I'd probably still do it that way, but it, you know, it was stressful. You know, I mean, I made the decision to do it, and but at the same time, I was in a position where I could do it. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I I didn't have to worry about, you know, a lot of things. But there's no way I could ever think about if I wanted to be independent. Well, that's the decision I made. Right. You know, this is where I want. This is what I want to do. I want to be independent, but I'm going to give that up to get quote unquote experience. Well. Flash here, most of your staff adjusters that are in the field, they're not first year adjusters. You know, they had to go inside for a while and sit yeah. behind a desk for a while. I mean, even you had four months of training that you had to go to and you were an experienced adjuster. Yeah. So now you're going to sit there and go through all of that, you know, plus inside adjusting for a while. And then you might get to go outside or they might say, guess what? You're not going out. And now you have absolutely zero scoping skills and zero yeah. experience of being an independent adjuster and what it's like. So what's the point? You know, yeah. I mean, I would just bite the bullet. I mean, if it were me, I would just bite the bullet and do it and make sure it works out for you. You know, if you currently have a career, you know, and it's, and it's, it's an expendable career, you know, stick with it until you get your opportunity, you know, and, and then hopefully things work out well for you. <laughs> just be be absolutely prepared whenever your opportunity comes and then take it. Yeah. So save back money and everything. I mean, right. and get your gear and all that stuff ready to go. If you're going to, if you're going to do that, um, I'm going to say if you run a, a career for 25 or 35 years as a staff working at, a, at an insurance company, mm -hmm. I know people, like I said, that have been with the same company for their entire work, almost their entire working careers. And some of those people would consider retiring nicely and not having to do anything but play golf, but those folks will consider retiring into being an IA. Right. When they've got decades of experience at, the, at all kinds of levels. And when you're in, at, in the corporate, in, the, in a company, they want to promote from within, they're going to, you know, they're going to pay for training. Yep. You might get an MBA out of it. You might get a, a CPCU out of it. As an adjuster, of all the things that you've got to have, there is really none more important than your state adjuster license, especially your very first one. You're going to need it to do just about everything else. Some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. Adjuster TV has partnered with Adjuster Pro because Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as a claims professional. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now. And then if you get all those credentials and you get all this and you get up into the, in the leadership, you know, levels, why would you want to go off and be an adjuster anyway? You know, right. it's probably, you probably have more fun in an air conditioned boardroom or a, you know, conference room than you'd be out sweating your butt off on roofs in a swamp in Southern Louisiana. Yeah. So I don't in know. September. It's, it's choices. I would say I wouldn't try to use one as a stepping stone to the other. Um, and going the other way, going from an IA to a staff adjuster, is even more challenging because a lot of companies won't hire IAs. Because they've, you've been independent for so long and they view you as almost unmanageable that you're going to be too restless and you've got yeah. certain preconceived ideas as far as what you should do. Her first hurricane blows up and you're gone. Right. 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 That's your thoughts. I, I've also heard, I've also seen some people that have decided to jump into the business and they wanted to go to work for a particular company. They saw a company was hiring for... Uh, inside property adjusters and they thought they would do that and try to get that job and they went to apply for it was given an opportunity but then they had to take a test okay they they gave him a sample you know they had to sit down and take a test and check their knowledge and they failed it and because they failed that test they could not go any further in the hiring process they couldn't even reapply for the job for for I forgot how long she said she had to wait till next that she could do it again so 
you know, it's just not a given, hey, I'm going to become a staff adjuster. You still got to have some experience or some skills and some knowledge and be able to pass certain levels of competency even to become a staff adjuster for some companies. Yeah. You know, even though they're willing to hire people without experience, you still have to have a certain level of competency before they're going to allow you to come in. So it's not real simple to just say, hey, I want to become a staff adjuster. Right, right. You know. I don't think it's a good way to go. Um, I would I wouldn't recommend doing that again because, you know, finally, you know, the kind of the final piece I think that whole thing is is that when you do go become a staff adjuster, you go you're joining a team, right? So then those people, um, you get to know your team, you got your managers counting on you, the company's counting on you, you, you start to get to know the you know when in your territory as a as a staff adjuster, you start to get to know the contractors in the area. And then you're like, all right, well, I think I got enough experience to go be an IA and you quit, you know, yeah. you're, you're letting all those people down, right? Cause then they got to bring somebody new in. It's going to cost, it's going to cost the insurance company another, who knows how much tens of thousands of dollars for another four months worth of training for that new person. Right. They don't want right. to do that. They want to try to hang on to you. So I would say pick one and go with it. And, and I don't want to be Mr. Negative here, but at the same time, not everybody makes it immediately and as successfully immediately as an IA. Sometimes you're going to get that opportunity. You're going to jump on your first storm. You know, you're thinking this is your chance. You go hit that storm. You're released from that storm. And you don't see any more work for a while, okay, um, for whatever reason. You haven't. And so here it is. Now you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. And maybe thought you might have made the wrong decision because you went a little bit too far between your next work or you're just weren't, something happened. And now you want to go back to work for that insurance company, they may not take you back, you know? Yeah. And then you want to go check out another company and you're trying to get a reference and they find out you're not eligible to be rehired for, for whatever reason, then that makes it more difficult. So I just, I'd probably just steer away, steer clear of that. Yeah. So this is something that I remember when I was, especially when I, kind of early on in my career, when I was kind of, you know, I had a bunch of friends and you started to get to know people and you get a call to go work and they would give you 24 hours to get there, 48 hours or whatever it is, you know, we're having a, a conference call on Sunday You know, it's Friday, get, get there by then or we're having a meeting four o'clock in the afternoon at this place in Denver and you're in wherever, I'm in Kansas City and... <coughs> I know guys that when they get that call, if they're like an eight hour drive away, they'll wait until like the morning of, they'll like, they'll use up that whole 48 hours and then leave Sunday morning so they can get there in time for the, the meeting Sunday afternoon. And I, I, I never did that because I was like, I wanna get there as fast as I can. Yeah as soon as possible because if I can get on the board and I've done it before where I, where I would, I mean, I shouldn't, I can't say I, I never did that. I have done that. And you go to that meeting and some, some, some people have already turned in claims, right? What do you guys, anybody who's already, you know, close few, been out there in the field, what are you guys seeing? And the guy chimes in or, you know, raises his hand or whatever. Um, I want to be that guy because that guy's already got four or five claims done yep. on by Sunday, right? He's going to start getting new claims, more, more new claims on Monday when the new claims, when the new batch comes in. And they, and they probably have a bunch kind of sitting in reserve, sitting there, you know, waiting for people to start turning claims in so they can start giving them out, especially on hail. Um, this is a numbers game. Absolutely. 100%. It's volume, especially on the cat side. You've got to literally everything that you can think of, every, every possible opportunity to close even a handful more claims adds up by the end of the year. And if you look at your season as a yearly thing from January to January, I wanna to try to close the minimum 400 claims in a year and more like 600 to 1,000, right? right? As, as a property cat adjuster. If I'm waiting till the last second to leave my house to go on a deployment because I can, because I, you know, I got some things to do before I go, I got to do this, whatever. 
I'm not going to, you know, I might get there, but I'm, it's going to be a lot more challenging than if I just, oh, sorry, honey, we have dinner plans tonight. So-and-so's birthday was t- on Saturday, tomorrow. I'm, I'm, I got to go. Yeah. You, you, you got to go. Um, it sucks, but you're not always missing birthdays and stuff. Most of the time, you're not. Um, Except for my wife's birthday is right in the middle of storm season. Um, yeah. You, you have to fly her out. Or yeah. Depending on where you're at. Um, speaking of which, we could probably talk about vacations a little bit. Um, that's one of those things we kind of touched on a little bit previously, but if you're, you get to a point in the storm where you're kind of like caught up every day or every, every three or four days, you can kind of like, if you wanted to take a vacation or half the family or spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever come and visit you, then you can take, like if, you know, you maybe go catch a, a baseball game in St. Louis or you go, you know, to the zoo in San Diego or you go, you go do some local stuff or go to like, if there's, if it's a good foodie town, you go, you know, go check out some restaurants or whatever. Um, that's a, it's a good thing to do that. I think people, you know, I get asked every now and then about p- how to take vacations as an adjuster. And I'm like, you kind of can't, you can't say, well, we're going to go to Ireland this summer because guaranteed the day before you go, your phone's going to ring. Hey, we got, and it's like, you know, big time, big hail. You have no it. idea how many times this year that I had something planned. I'm back home. Oh, it doesn't look like anything's coming up. I think I'm going to sign up for this bass tournament this weekend and just take the RV down to the lake and the wife and I can hang out and not fish my tournament and we're going to have a good time. And so I'm going to go ahead and pay that entry fee. And literally 30 minutes later. Yeah. Hey, James. Hey, bud. Can you be somewhere by tomorrow? Uh, I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Happened several times this year. Or we planned a small little trip and wife got to go on a vacation and take her daughter. Yeah, right. You know, and uh, and I got to go work. So it's, it's hard a, to do that. 2020 has been a busy year. I mean, it's been. You know, and, and uh, I wish we could have another 2020, I'll be honest with you. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, for me. don't count on it. Um, you know, one of the things we're talking about, you know, getting out, you know, when you get the call and, and leaving, that's me, man. I, I want to. I want to leave town as fast as I can yeah. for several reasons. A, you know, I'm Mr. Paranoid. What if my car breaks down? Something happens on the way. You know, whatever. I don't want to, I don't want surprises. I want to have enough time to take care of any issues that happen, you know, along yeah. the way. Um, the other thing is, I mean, so actually I saw this this morning, one of my favorite movies of all time, 25th anniversary of it, the movie Heat with Al Pacino. There's a phrase in the movie that says, don't have anything in your life you can't wait, walk away from in 10 seconds flat when you feel the heat coming around the corner. Well, you know, I don't live my life that way because i got too much stuff I'm attached to. But as an adjuster, you know, that's kind of what you have to live your life if you're going to do cat. You know, yeah. don't, have anything, don't have anything on the agenda you can't walk away from immediately when you get that phone call yep. that you can't drop. And if you can't structure your life that way, then this is probably not the career for you. I yeah. would have to say that. I mean, I would, I mean, it just, that's the way it, you have to do it. Yeah. I had phone calls where, I mean, I literally got the phone call at five o'clock in the afternoon and I had to be on location at noon the next day and I had a seven hour drive, you know? Yeah. And so it was hanging up the phone, grabbing all my stuff, throwing it in the back of the truck, driving a few hours tonight and then finishing up in the morning, you know? And, yeah. uh, it's, it's that hectic you know, when you get that phone call. So. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I, I, most of my career or a lot of my career, I was single. So try having it yeah. like a social life as, as a single person and the, as a cat adjuster. And I chose cat work every time. Yeah. Just about every time. And you don't know how many, I young, was single for a while. You <laughs> don't know how many young ladies you did a favor to. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of parents appreciative of your life decision. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so I, I just driving there the same day, no way. I mean, I had assignments that were only that were only three hours away. 
I was there the next, I was there the day before, you know, yeah. making sure that I was set up, ready to go. Oh, yeah. And there's no always some problems. I was just, there's no way I could have done that. No. If you're interested in getting the absolute best property claims training available, then I want to tell you about my friends over at Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster with a focus on catastrophe property adjusting. When you graduate from the Boss Trained Insurance Adjuster Program, you're ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you have to get some training somewhere. But Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, as well as its continuing support and mentorship for graduates long after students become working adjusters. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if Voss is the right choice for you. Adjustertv.com slash VAS. Justin Williams has a couple more questions. Justin Williams. Yeah, we, he's, he had a whole big stack of good ones. Um, what would you say, let's see. If I sing out of tune. Yeah. What do you think that are the most difficult parts of the job as a whole? That's gonna be different for everybody. Um, you know, when you, in the beginning, it's just really the the real learning curve part of it. You yeah. know, you can do, again, you can sit there and take all the training in the world, okay, and have all the f fake scenarios. But when you actually have to execute it, okay, that, those first couple of claims, especially that first cl claim, happened to me. I mean, you freeze up. I mean, you just you're just sitting there going, oh, crap, what do I do, you know? What do I do from here? And it happened to me not just on property, but it happened to me on on auto. It, it's it's a uh, that that to me is a very that first claim is your most difficult claim. Yeah. And then after that, they get easier and easier. But as far as the whole job and the whole career, you know, for me and and I worked a lot this year. Um, you know, I'm one of those guys that actually loves his wife. You know. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, you know, and, those uh, guys. yeah. And, and man, I, I just, uh, I enjoy, I married her for a reason. I like being around her, you know, and, fair uh, enough, fair enough. and being gone for extended periods of time, you know, away from home. Now we're in a position, luckily where, you know, she can come visit me a couple, you know, on occasion. And I've been lucky to get home, you know, on some weekends, but, uh, still that much time away from home. And I've got dogs. I enjoy being around. You know, and even though my kids are older and grown, you know, I still like seeing them, you know. So that part for me is my most difficult part of this career is just the time away from home yeah. and family. I couldn't imagine, um, you know, if my kids were young, you know, yeah. and, and having this career, it, it would be extremely difficult. Um, if I did this career as a as a young man, I would definitely make sure I was in a position where um, my wife would be able to come visit often while I was on the road, yep. you know, even though that's kind of a distraction while you're on the road to have somebody there. Cause my wife comes and visits. I'm definitely is less productive during those days, but, uh, I just, I couldn't see it. That's just me. I mean, yeah. some people are just fine with it. Some people, well, hey, everybody I know that's got little kids that does it. They're not fine with it. Yeah. You know, and I traveled, I mean, in my previous careers, my kids were little and I traveled a lot, uh, back then. But I was home every single weekend. I was home every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, or, you know, I was only gone maybe a couple of days during the week. That's quite a bit different than leaving the house and don't know exactly when you're coming home. Right. Six you months know? later. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's a lot more difficult in week after week after week. Yeah. I mean, back in 2006, um, the, the fall of 2006 to the spring of 2000, I'm oh, sorry, 2005 to 2006, I traveled 27 straight weeks and spent at least two nights in a foreign country. Dang. for 27 straight weeks but i was home three four nights a week you know so that was completely different back then now with what we do here and having those you know two 14 days to 60 days or longer being gone that's just couldn't do it with small kids yeah, yeah. Do it. 
yeah, the, the social aspect, um, you, you do kind of have to make a choice between the two, and it's, it's hard to juggle them without them both suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it also being a strain on your yourself and then on those relationships. Um, and then, I mean, as far as like the most difficult part of the job from a, like a practical standpoint, um, I think that learning the job is hard. It can be hard. There's a learning curve to it. Uh, after a while, I, there was a point several years into my career where I, I started to, I noticed that I wasn't being surprised anymore. Like, I mean, there's always something occasionally, but it was like, I'm just not seeing like a new scenario that I haven't seen before. And when, and that makes the job a whole lot easier when you have that kind of like familiarity with it. Um, I, it's could be argued that I did it for too long. I've, I've heard people say that, you know, the typical, the average lifespan of a cat adjuster doing cat is two years, right. Wow. On the staff side. Um, I don't know what it is on the, the, the IA side, but I've, I was a cat adjuster for 20 years, you know, and I loved it. And the better I got at it, the more I loved it. I loved it because it was, you know, it got to be pretty easy. I'm addicted to it. It's a little bit addicting. Yeah. That's a fact. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine. Yeah. You know, so many times in my life, you know, I'm in my mid fifties, you know, and, and so many times in my life when people would actually ask me, what are you going to do five years from now? Wouldn't have a clue. Absolutely, just like I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and and I had some successful, very successful career previously, and 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 jobs and and things that I did were were great, but I just didn't really enjoy them that much. It was just I did them because I was good at them. You know, like my wife said one time, "You're really good at making money. You really suck at being happy." You know, <laughs> and uh, and so I ended up doing this, and I absolutely love it. And you ask me now, what are you going to do five years from now? I said, well, I'm probably going to be an adjuster. You know, I'm yeah. going to be doing this. This is what I'm going to be doing. And uh, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I love it that much, you know. And uh, But I will also say this, it ain't for everybody. I, mean, I, know, oh, we, no. <laughs> I know that's what we, at the end of the day, that's what we sell here on Adjuster TV is becoming an adjuster, you know. But at the same time, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture no. and, and try to tell people, yeah, this is what you need to do and they shouldn't do it. It's, it's, it's difficult at times, you know, every day is different, you know, when you're out there, um, you're, you're moving from, you're learning so much, you know, and you're about to pull your hair out, but Hey, guess what? You'll adjust. And we haven't come to the dad joke part of this presentation yet. Hey, but I couldn't resist. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here's he, he, Justin's got a couple of, couple more good questions. I want to get in here cause these are a little bit of a change of pace. Um, what literature are you reading and what are your suggestions? And then do you have any self development or professional development suggestions? What do I read? What do you read? I can't read. It's too bad. I'm an adult with ADD. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't have pictures, you know, in colors it's just i'm not gonna get through the book <laughs> so i love books yeah i do not have add yeah. i don't think um i will read fiction on my phone like K- the kindle app yep. i will buy cookbooks so i can lay them out on the counter and you know yeah. flower arm or whatever and then i will get audio books for business books and i've read read finger quotes a lot of business books. And I think that, uh, let me just go through my Audible app here real quick. One of my favorite ones is a book called The One Thing. Audible. You know, why does everybody keep telling me that I need to Dude, read that? Get it on here. Get it on this. Um, it is, let me see here. The One Thing. Uh, it's by Gary Keller and Jay Papazon. Yep. yep. And it is, 
I think of all the books that I've ever read, like sort of self, you know, professional development, maybe self, that's kind of self-help, I guess. This is probably the best one because it helps you to prioritize the most important things. And when, once you do that and focus on, instead of having a list of nine things you got to do today, you're picking one thing. What's in there's, there's whole, the whole like mantra that you say is what's the one thing that I can do for my five-year goal, my one-year goal, my one-month goal, my one-week goal, my one-day goal? What's, if we'll say the one-day goal, what's the one thing I can do right now that will make my goal for today either easier or make it, all of the things to, to achieve that goal today either easier or unnecessary, right? So in other words, what's the one thing I can do right this second to get this claim closed? Right. Yep. What's the one thing I could do right now to get all these claims closed today? What's the one thing I could do right now to get caught up on this or that? Right. And it applies to every possible thing. Yep. And, you, you know, you make a, a, a five year, a 10 year plan, you know, or just have, not a plan, but like just having goals. Then you, you just reverse engineer that one. What's the one thing I could do for that five year thing that will make all the things either easier or unnecessary? What's the, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and they, they go into great detail. I mean, it's not just that, but they go into a lot of detail about prioritizing, you know, uh, the things that are important and things that are, you don't, why bother doing that? It's not going right. to move the ball at all. Well, I mean, I was joking about the not reading thing. I know. So, um, I mean, my, my go-to is guns and ammo and Bassmaster magazine. <laughs> That's pretty much it. No, I, I read a lot of sports biographies. Yeah. Uh, or I read like his, what I call historical based fiction stories that are set in different periods where they're taking the, the events and the political events of that time, but yet they're putting in like another little story, but yet it's surrounded by that. And so it gives you a little bit of the historical, you know, it gives you a little bit of history while at the same time giving you a nice little story to keep you intrigued in it. Even though it's a piece of fiction, you're actually getting some Oh yeah, and yeah. I'll sit there and I'll critique it and go, "Well, that didn't really happen," you know. But yeah, I got to remember it's fiction, you know. It's like whenever I watch movies for adaptations to historical things, and it's like they've totally butchered it. I'm like, cause I'm a history buff, and uh, you go, no, that didn't happen. Caesar didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I've got like another really good one is seven habits of highly effective people. I have read that. Absolutely. 100%. To, that is required reading. Yep. Um, I've got uh, crush it. Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, I think that book came out. Seven habits came out. What? 1990, 89, 90. Uh, I don't know. But then there was the eighth habit, which I can't remember what that yeah. was about, but so, and then profit first by Mike McCallowicz. Atomic Habits, which is another good one. Um, this is Marketing by Seth Godin. Hey, hey. Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> good. Right. This is actually Guy Grant from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the High End Training Center Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come right along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. Then I've got Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babich. Babin. Leif Babin. Uh, and then he, they have the second follow-up follow to have the dichotomy of leadership. Um, there's a bunch in there. And it's, listen, if you're driving across the country, you're driving to storm deployment, you know, you can, you can listen to a six and a half hour book Right. 
inside of that trip easily. Right. I'll listen to a lot of podcasts. Oh yeah. And podcasts you know, for I sure. mean, I'll pick out, you know, there's a few that I like, you know, that some are just entertaining, yep. you know, and some of them are, are insurance claims related, you know, yep. um, I'm not going to plug a couple of them right now, but we'll wait till later for that. But, uh, um, I kind of enjoy listening to what's going on in the industry and, uh, yeah, yeah. and I do listen to Chris's, you know, um, I'll listen to his, but I'm so far behind on his right now. I mean, I've, I have weeks of Chris's yeah, podcast no. to listen to. I'll binge but, uh, listen to podcasts and then I won't listen to him for like two years and then I'll jump right. back in. And But I've got, uh, I just stay so stinking busy, you know, yeah. that, you know, when, and really the only time I do have time to maybe do audiobooks is whenever I'm driving because when I'm at home, I'm, I'm doing stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, lots of fishing. I mean, priorities. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, Come on. that hey. and whatever my wife tells me to do. Yeah. When I'm, when I first, first get home. What else? What was the other part of that question? Was, uh, do you have any self development and professional development suggestions? I mean, I, I would say just keep, just read, read yeah. wide and deep for sure. And I would also say network, network. a lot. Network. network, network, and network, and network. Make yourself available. I mean, I, I wouldn't say to go so far as to offer to sweep the floor at the offices at the right. IA firm, but uh, you know, close to that, you know. I mean, there the, all those folks are all concentrated in either Dallas, Fort Worth, or Mobile. Right. You know, with some scale. Then there's they're all over the place, but those there's a lot in those two places. You know, one of the things I make it a point to do is. Um, I mean, I just, whether I'm doing work for an IA firm right now or I haven't seen work in a while, on a regular, I've got certain people. I just pick up the phone. Hey, what's up? What's going on? Yeah. I know you don't have anything happening right now and going on. I just want to make sure you don't forget my name. And yeah. I will tell them that, you know, and they understand it, you know. And uh, and because I make that joke, I don't want you to forget my name, you know, it. it they don't. They don't, you know. Hi, here's James. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, it's the relationships that you build, you know, and when I call yes. up and say, Hey, I'm calling you up just because, uh, you know, I hadn't heard from you in a while. I really don't need anything. And I just don't want you to forget my name. And I'm not just doing that. I'm also, Hey man, how are you doing? What, you, yeah. what have you been up to? You know, I don't just, just ask them about business. I don't say, Hey, you know, how busy y'all been or what's been going. I don't ask those questions. I'll just go, how have you been, man? Everything going okay with you? Health has been good. You know, family's good. And that sort of thing, and, and I will ask those questions and make it more human, other than just some sterile work. Hey, man, it's James. Don't forget about me. I'm out here. You know, just take an interest in them and create those relationships. And remember, we, I mean, we've we've talked about this previously, um, that people are mobile in this industry. Yeah. They leave one firm and go to another, and you know, they're gonna have a project one day, and they're gonna think, Hey, man, this dude's perfect for it. You know, yeah, because exactly he's, right. you know, they the people like to take their own people with them, and they people, do. you know, they'd rather do business with IAs that they've done business with in the past versus calling up a whole bunch of guys that aren't proven. They're like, well, I got to, yep. you know, yeah, hey, I can call James because he's built me out before and he's done a great job, or I can call Bob who I don't know anything about, and yep. I really don't. You know, I can take that chance. You're a resource, yeah, for them because they because they have demands, right? Right. You know, when you're when you're running claims, you get assigned a bunch of claims. You got people calling you. Everybody wants their house looked at. You know, you've got all this pressure from all these different directions. Well, your manager and the people that are manage your manager and the people that manage those people, they also have a lot of pressure on them coming from different places, but pressure nonetheless, right? And you've got resources as an IA. Well, you know. I need these tools to do this, that, and the other thing. And I can, you know, I've got an assistant or I've got this. Everybody's got that same thing. And if they know you're, a, like you just said, you're, you're a known quantity or resource. Yep. And that's why they call it human resources, yep. right? So they, if they know that, you, that you're that you a resource for them, they know what they're going to get from you. It's the, the devil that they know versus... Yep. The devil they don't. The devil that they don't. So they're they're going to... This is, it's all part of networking. It's, you know, reaching out and touching people periodically, calling them, send them an email, send them a text, whatever it is. Calling is probably the best thing because yep. you're talking to them. Um, that's the heart of it. And people that complain that they don't do very well, that this is hard a job to do, whatever, they're, they're not very 
they need to work on their networking skills. Right. It's hard even with that, right. but it's still, it's not, we're not putting satellites into orbit. I mean, it's not splitting atoms. And Worst thing you can do, man, is get your license and fill out a bunch of resumes or fill out a bunch of apps and get on a bunch of rosters and never talk to a person. Yeah. yeah. Which is another reason that. why going to NACA is a good idea because you get to meet those people face to face. That's right. You know, are they yep. paying for these free promos that I'm giving them? <laughs> we have a deal worked out. Okay, I'm just making sure. It's like sure. it's a cross promotional thing. Okay, I got you. Okay. Anyway, so. am I getting paid for that? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, it, networking is, you know, it. I know some people hate it, and I know younger people hate picking up the phone. You yeah. know, they're scared of it for whatever reason. You know, like it's going to eat them. But, uh, man, you got to network. You got to make those phone calls. You got to reach out to people. You got to, yep. you know, just, and again, man, get, just, you know, it's like, well, that's like being in sales. And I don't, I don't like that. That's just too salesy. Hey, you know what? I used to think that I don't want to be in sales. I'm a creative, you know, video guy or whatever. Yeah. Everything that you do is sales. You know, it's like I explained to the young guy one day. It's like, that's too much like sales. I don't want to do sales. I say, have you ever kissed a girl? Yeah, you're in sales. <laughs> yeah, right? You closed the deal. Yeah, you know. So, you know, you ask and you closed it. and you. So there you go. So, I mean, that's, you don't realize how many things in your life that you do that you're actually selling. Yeah, You know, exactly right. and it's it, in, the, in the rawest sense of selling you're selling so don't sit there and say you can't okay exactly now yes i have a history in sales yes i've done sales hated sales again one of those things i was really good at my wife said i was really good at but i was really bad at being happy you know right. and one of those things was sales and uh but you know you got skills use them yep yep so so i had this one <clears throat> hurricane I want to say it was Ivan. It might have been Gene. Anyway, I went to this guy's house, and uh, he comes out. You know, I knock on the front door, and he comes out in the front yard, and we're standing there talking. And I was like, "Well, you know, I introduced myself, and and I said, uh, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the house, you know." And he wanted to like tag along, mm-hmm. and so he starts pointing at literally everything on his house and saying that the hurricane caused it. And so he's like, you know, that cracked window right there, that hurricane definitely did that. You know, I better put that on your sheet, you know. And that piece of dirt on the side of the house, that's from the hurricane. And he goes, and there was a tree, a giant tree. He didn't have a fence or anything that, that was probably, I don't know, 20 yards from the house that fell away from the house off into the woods. And he said, and I'm not joking, he said, and when that tree fell down, ever since that tree fell down, the, the vibrations from the, the tree hitting the ground had damaged my washer and dryer. So those got to be replaced as well as were damaged by the hurricane. And I said, I looked at him and I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we just kept going. I did not put those on the estimate and it never came up again, but it was like, it was literally every single, every possible thing. Could, he could was play. It, yeah. Like well, you know, the paint is getting a little bit yellow in here. That was caused by the hailstorm. I was like, or the hurricane. I was like, I'm just. I wrote up everything I could, and then here you go, buddy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not paying for your washer and dryer because of the, you know. That's you a, can t- take him, have a tech look at him, or whatever. You know, he didn't push it, but it was like just. A, what? It was amazing in after a hurricane, how many people claimed. Their TV sets were not working. Yeah. Amazed at that. You know, I mean, it blew my mind. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, we're happy to pay for it if you could show that the storm did something to it. I mean, come on. You know, can you plug it in? <laughs> You're right. It's Have you, did you turn it on? You know? Did you hit the. So uh, I had this one. Well, this was. I have. On this particular house, I have five stories from the same house. Oh, my gosh. Let's do one. Let's do one. So the best one was, this was a um, a mansard roof, Mm -hmm. a flared mansard roof. All right. Yeah. So uh, 
Yeah, you know, and for those of you not really sure, just look at a McDonald's, and that's a mansard roof. Okay, um, shingles down the side, flat top. It had a a railing that went around the top of the flat roof. Uh, tree fell on it, uh, damaged the 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 side of the roof, the the mansard part of it. Um, damaged a few shingles there. Hits the roof, punctures the uh, the modified bitumen that was on there. And as I was inspecting it, I noticed that it didn't have just one layer of bitumen in decking. Below the decking, there was another layer of modified bitumen. And so when they'd replaced the roof last time, just redecked over it, modified bitumen went on. Also, that railing that was around it, it was damaged. And it was PVC. It was a PVC railing that they put up there rather than wood. So I guess the last time it was damaged, that's what they went with. The It was... Even though it was something you could buy in bulk, they had to do a little bit of customization to it uh, to make it work on the roof. So I was justified. I kind of ran it up the flagpole a little bit, and they said, yeah, just go ahead and pay for the whole thing. Well, if you've never priced PVC railing, okay, it it can get very expensive. And we're talking this is about $5,000 worth of material here that we had to replace. So we replace it. So I, I write up the estimate. I send it up. I explain to the guy what we had done. He says, no, that's fantastic. You know, thanks for doing that. You know, the truth is, we're probably not going to replace all of that railing, but I was justifying doing it because I got it approved. Roofer comes out, looks at everything. The part on the mansard roof that was the shingle part of it, it's got some damage to it. I had addressed that. Well, he said it needed more and had to replace all of it around the whole thing. And I'm like... I just really don't see that why it can be repaired. You know, it, it was fairly new. I look when this happens, and he's trying to give me every reason why it had to be replaced. I'm not replacing it, you know. But they want to reinspect, okay? And they run up the ladder. So my manager goes out with me on this reinspect, and we get there and we start looking at it. And we'd already discussed it, what we're facing, what we're looking at. He goes over, looks at it. And he's looking at the whole thing. Goes. Why are you replacing all this railing? We can't replace all that railing. Okay, we'll go ahead and replace that roof up to here. We'll give you this much rather than what you're asking for, which is still 50% more. But uh, we got to knock that railing back down to this. And that contractor was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what just happened here? And basically that railing would almost cover this guy's deductible. Right. And so we just took it all away from him and only gave him like maybe I think 600 bucks. 700 bucks so you know a lot of times you sit there and you try to play fair you know with these uh with these contractors and these homeowners and you explain what you do and then they turn around and get greedy you know right it can bite them in the rear sometimes and it can bite you in the rear too if you don't explain it properly and right. maybe run it up a flagpole before you make the decision and whenever i did the original when i originally paid for that railing i put in my notes paid railing after discussion with Right. And so wait, so you, you were able to pay for it, but then you didn't pay for it. Right. How did that go over? They weren't happy about it. No. So I think they ended up paying for it, you know, right. but it was, they were trying to prove a point to these guys, you know, I, I think that was the whole, the whole thing about it. Right. So I think when it was all done, we paid for the, they paid for the rail and they just paid for just a little bit more on that roof but they weren't going to give them the entire seven months from that time. They probably paid for the whole thing. Yeah, no telling. The desk so. adjuster got got involved with it, and well, this was the same house that the homeowner kept trying to play me against the inside adjuster, and so they already didn't have a real good reputation with the carrier. Yeah, well, so, maybe they got dropped. Who knows? Carriers do that. Who knows? But it was a crazy one. But uh, I would never forget that because whenever my manager says, "Oh, we're not, we can't pay for this," now I'm like going, "What? Uh, wait a <laughs> what? minute." My name's all over this. <laughs> <laughs> Is this going to really happen? So, but I think we ended up. I think when I'm pretty sure that when by the time we left, we had agreed to pay for it, and everything got kind of right. squashed you just, down. You were just putting the, the fear of yeah, everything got squashed down a little bit because right. we were just trying to point out to them, "Hey, look, we've already been a little bit generous with you guys, and you know, you're you're coming back into the cookie jar a little bit too much." Yeah. So, yeah. all right, you know what time it is. I think it's dad joke bingo time. There we go. There we go.
Why do nurses like red crayons? Why do nurses like red crayons? Because sometimes they have to draw blood. <laughs>